Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you as always from here at the podcasting studios at the Czech Media Group, one of our chamber champions. I'd like to acknowledge, as always, that I live and work in the ancestral land of the Lekwungen speaking nations, known to us all as Songhees and Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. Very often I'll say to somebody, uh, yeah, I was just talking to the mayor, and they'll say, which one? Because, of course, we have we have 13 of them and we have nine nations here as well. Uh, the mayor we're talking to today, though, is the mayor of the big one, the largest municipality of our 13. That is the District of Saanich. Welcome, Mayor Dean Murdoch. How are you? I'm well, Bruce. Thanks for having me. You were part of that whole seismic shift that happened 16 months ago on the municipal election scene when you defeated the incumbent mayor and came in. So 16 months into this term, how are things in general compared to when it started? Uh, You know, it's been a a very busy 16 months, uh, but uh, I think that we're off to uh, a strong start. Uh, There's a lot of really good work underway. Um, Council uh, came together quickly to uh, develop its strategic priorities and publish a a strategic plan. And uh, over the course of the last 16 months, we've been um, really disciplined and focused on delivering initiatives that are are, uh, related to or under the, the major theme areas that we identified as a group. Yeah, you were on council previously, of course, for, if I'm not mistaken, 10 years or so. But now in the mayor's chair, what are the surprises involved in going from being a councillor to being the mayor? Well, you know, uh, I felt well prepared coming into the role. I, as you said, I had 10 years as a councillor. But the role is uh, significantly bigger. Uh, There's uh, a lot more that uh, you really have to have awareness of. Uh, I think one of the benefits of being a a councillor is, you know, you can be assigned a, a committee portfolio and you sort of become a somewhat subject matter expert on on one or a couple of topics. Uh, when you're in the mayor's chair, uh, you're not really a subject matter expert, but you you have some awareness of all of the pieces that are going on within the organization and then things that are, are emerging in the community as priorities. And so uh, it, it really is sort of that, uh, you know, I- I- inch deep and a mile wide in terms of all of the things you, you have to stay on top of. And there are always those people that say, well, I'm going to call City Hall. I'm going to email the mayor or something. They've all, there's issues. That, what are the most common things that you hear from voters when they contact you? Yeah, it's, uh, you're right that it's uh, probably the most frequent thing that happens in my office is a phone call or an email uh, about a, a specific issue somebody has. Usually something on their street. Uh, it's sometimes to do with, with waste collection or um, parking on the street, uh, something that needs to be removed. Uh, uh, I often am uh, contacted when somebody's gone through a process with staff and they're not satisfied with the outcome. And so they've come to me to to have a look at it. And I usually uh, refer that to our chief uh, chief administrative officer, Brent Reams, uh, who has the operational responsibility for the organization. But that's uh, certainly a, a major part of the role as well as being that sort of uh, liaison facilitator uh, between as a service provider and, and the residents we serve. How about taxes? Do people reach out about taxes? You know, I, I definitely hear about taxes, especially as we're putting a budget together and appreciate that, uh, you know, the, the number we're looking at is uh, is not insignificant. It's going to have an impact for people. But I would say for every email I get or phone call I get about um, the, the tax bill, there's probably another 10 that I get about service, uh, wanting to see an increase in service or improvements in service. And of course, I think folks appreciate that those things are paid for with taxes. And so, Council is in a position of uh, trying to strike a balance uh, and ensure that we're, we're being sensitive to the impact we have uh, on the taxpayer, uh, while also looking after infrastructure and, uh, and services that are a priority for residents in our, in our municipality. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Taxes are what delivers the services that we all expect. But there's, you know, when you're making these tough decisions, what sort of criteria is applied to that process when decisions are made about taxes? Well, of course, you know, as a, as a group, we're, uh, we want to be disciplined about the use of taxpayers' dollars. Uh, we have an opportunity in August uh, to do uh, a budget guideline. So staff come forward and say, here are you know, the things that are forming the operational requirement. We anticipate that you know, the need is going to be something within this realm in terms of an increase. And council has an opportunity to say, you know, we're, we're going to try and push that down. That, that's starting to creep up to a level that we're, we're not going to be comfortable with. 
Uh, those pieces start to come together at the end of the year as we have a better understanding of what BC assessment might be um, providing us with for the tax rule, um, what all of those uh, operating costs are going to look like. And usually at that point, council is signaling to staff, you know, you're going to have to tighten that up. Um, we This year was a unique one where we were also confronted with uh, a program to um, begin long-term support to, for infrastructure replacement. Uh, a new council has focused on that as a priority, but with a new level of understanding of those infrastructure replacement costs and facility replacement costs, which was going to add another 1.5% to the budget. And then the debt servicing that goes along with that, if you're going to borrow money, uh, adds another 0.65% to the budget. So the discipline around that, the rigor around that is, okay, all in, operational requirements, services, infrastructure replacement, how do we push that down so that we're not overwhelming people with these costs? And we appreciate that these are things that need to be done incrementally. Something else that I'm sure you have and will hear more about is the Citizens' Assembly that's being done with yeah. the City of Victoria. This is the whole, in, in simplest of terms, the, the exploration of amalgamation of, if not governments, then at least services between the two. So where's that at right now? Yeah, so uh, we're actually just about to to launch. Uh, I just had a look at uh, the materials that are going to go out to residents in Victoria and Saanich. Um, uh, Victoria Mayor Marianne Alto and I uh, both uh, have a signature on the letter along with the facilitator of the process. And uh, that's going to be an invitation to people who are interested in, in participating in the Citizens Assembly uh, to put forward an application to do that. Uh, that there will be a civic lottery process that will uh, be used by the facilitator to, to draw 48 names to participate. Um, they're going to meet over the course of uh, eight weekends to uh, to look at the pros and cons of uh, amalgamation. And they'll be um, supported by a staff resource who can provide them with the information necessary to do that analysis. And when they've wrapped up their work, they're going to submit some recommendations uh, that may include uh, a recommendation for amalgamation or service integration uh, that we will then, uh, both municipalities, will put in front of uh, voters at the next municipal election. So we're going to talk next about some issues that are front and center for everybody, including housing. We're going to talk about that next. Our guest today on Chamber Chats is the mayor of the District of Saanich, and, and he is Dean Murdoch. So you, for construction, when it's underway right now, we want that to move as quickly as possible because we need the housing. But explain to me some of the tax exemptions that are in place right now for construction projects. So uh, the thing that, uh, that we're looking at is where we have the opportunity to uh, remove community amenity contributions, uh, where there may be DCCs or uh, development cost charges that would be omitted uh, in the event it, for nonprofit housing development. So we're specifically looking at uh, housing that uh, is affordable, geared to rent, uh, or sorry, rent geared to income. Um, and uh, ensuring that we're, we're doing our part by supporting that with redu reduced costs that would otherwise drive up the cost to someone who is going to rent in, in that uh, new building. So that, that's a position that this council has uh, taken this term. And uh, once the units are built uh, on a property, then it would also be eligible for uh, property tax exemption. And that would effectively be the municipal contribution towards those projects. The other thing we're doing is uh, actively pursuing partnerships with uh, nonprofits and senior governments who are on Saanich owned assets. So like the Nellie McClung Library branch, for example, is one where um, we want to replace that branch. But we think there's an opportunity to work with BC Housing and Capital Regional Housing Corporation to do uh, affordable housing on top of that. So it's really focusing on trying to create more affordability in this community so that you know, more people can afford to, to put down roots and build a life in, in Saanich and the capital region. And speaking of building and perming and all that stuff, in the big picture, the OCP, the Official Community Plan, yeah. municipalities all have one. It's at various stages of completion or execution. Uh, the OCP in the District of Saanich is now going to start changing, if you will, or morphing or being recreated. That, this is a massive undertaking. Tell me about that. Yeah, so our official community plan is uh, now 16 years old. Um, the uh, previous council actually got the process started to do a strategic update of the OCP. Um, staff uh, undertook a consultative process over the course of most of last year, uh, a series of open houses and webinars and sessions and surveys and opportunity for people to, to weigh in on what the future of the district is going to look like. 
Um, that document has now uh, been uh, in its final draft. Uh, council has given second reading to the OCP and we're going to hold a public hearing. So it'll uh, likely be at the end of April. We'll have the opportunity, the public will have the opportunity again to weigh in on, on what that vision is going to look like. And you're right, it really is the uh, the document that's going to help guide growth uh, in the future, perhaps as many as 15 years, but certainly over the next five years. Um, and we want to focus around our, our corridors, our centers and villages, of course, you know, creating space in neighborhoods so that more uh, multi multifamily units can be built as well, more family suitable homes. Uh, and making sure that we're we're focusing around our, our centers and corridors where people are close to to services, to public transit, to good active transportation infrastructure, and the things like parks, schools, and shopping are all in walking distance for for the folks who are going to settle in our community. Yeah, I mean, this is a very different place than it was in 2008. So this this reexamining examining of that is quite timely. So when we talk about that too, there's kind of a hub. The the center of Saanich, some would say, is around Uptown. And there's this enormous plan that's available on the Saanich website that talks about uh, the, the uptown, the Douglas Corridor, that whole area, and the plan that's going to happen goes as far over as Tennyson Avenue on one side. Uh, a, a transit hub has been announced. The province has bought some land for that adjacent to uptown. So that's an enormous... Tell me about that. Where's that plan at? Yeah, it's a very exciting, um, transformative vision for, for that corridor. And, and you're right, that re really is sort of Saanich's downtown. Uh, that's the area where we anticipate the, the highest density, the tallest buildings, where we know that you know, people who, are, who want to settle in our community, working professionals who, who want to be centrally located, it's an ideal location for them. Uh, and it's also you know, um, really at the crossroads of the South Island. It's where, um, if you're making those connections, either coming in from the peninsula, coming in from the West Shore, headed downtown, or headed up to the university, a lot of that sort of turns around that uptown corridor, which is why the uh, the province is keen on moving forward with a, a transit hub in that location. Um, when that occurs, it, the change that it will help um, enable with public transit will be significant, and it'll really turn much more into a hub and spoke model that will serve the South Island, I think, much more efficiently, allowing people to get to where they need to go. And of course, you know, uh, through transit-oriented development, uh, the province also intends to do some residential development around that, that that's their vision for, for how these transit hubs ought to be served. And uh, that fits very well with our vision, um, as articulated in the Uptown Douglas Corridor Plan. They would see that become a, a much higher density uh, location where we really wrap around all of the services and amenities that people would be seeking in that kind of location. Uh, so ballpark, how many housing units are going to be created around that whole plan? Do you know? Uh, I don't have a, a number in terms of what number of units it will deliver, but uh, we know uh, there's a uh, development uh, proposal underway at the old uh, bowling alley site uh, at Mayfair, which is the southernmost point uh, for Saanich uh, of that corridor. And they're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 24 stories and uh, three towers. So, I mean, that's hundreds of, of units. And the developer has suggested that those will be rental units. So, I mean, that's that's bringing a lot of new residential uh, homes online for people who, um, you know, I, I think probably largely working professionals, people who are looking to be uh, centrally located. Um, and that, I think, is a really good location to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, everybody's kind of in their mind saying, yeah, so the Pat Bay comes in and then the Trans-Canada comes in and Sandwich Road is there and it turns into, that's a, there's a lot going on there. That's why this is all happening. So when we talk about that kind of development, we know that there's a balance of that with park space, Parks and Rec in Sandwich. And there's a 10-year plan in place for Parks and Rec too. Tell me about that. Yeah, so we're embarking on a new uh, process to uh, identify the growth and uh, and priorities that will occur for parks and recreation. I think uh, we're a growing community and uh, our plans call for a, a significant growth in the number of folks who are going to settle here uh, in, in the next decade. And so uh, I think that the planning process is alive to that, that there's going to be a growth in, in recreation, certainly in demand uh, and the use of our park spaces. So that uh, planning process is going to help articulate what that vision looks like to help guide the decisions that council will make around new facilities and infrastructures and, and services, as well as green space uh, procurement and development that's going to need to happen. Uh, as that process gets underway, uh, there'll be an opportunity uh, for the public to participate and, and help inform what that vision looks like. Uh, you know, our end goal here is to make sure that as people settle in our community, as well as the residents who, who've lived in the community a long time, 
uh, continue to enjoy a high level of service and, and access to uh, to our green spaces and natural areas. And, uh, it'll be really helpful to have a, a guiding document that, that helps us uh, with that growth over the next 10 years. There's also a way that through the District of Saanich, you can get a coloring book. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> going to talk about that next. Our guest today on Chamber Chats is Dean Murdoch. He's the mayor of the District of Saanich. And there's a whole bunch of committees, mayor, that people can serve on. Um, one of them is the Heritage Foundation that people can be involved with. And that involves a coloring book. So tell me about that. Yeah, so this was a, a fun project that the Heritage Foundation uh, undertook. Um, actually, it was uh, the, at the time the Arts, Culture and Heritage Committee that put together uh, a coloring book that was a celebration of heritage. And the idea, of course, with it being a coloring book, is that the whole family would get involved. Uh, this was um, also uh, coupled with uh, a, a tour that people could do. So go and find these locations, have a look at them, um, really just trying to make heritage much more engaging uh, and something that people could uh, could relate to that was accessible in their lives. And uh, it was great uptake. I know that uh, it was we had a great response from families who were uh, Really excited to see, you know, a new way of, uh, of understanding more about the history of, uh, of Saanich and the South Island. Everything, it seems, is going to loop back to housing some way, shape or form and a connection there. So another committee you have is the Affordable Housing Committee. Tell me about the committee. What does it do? Who's on it? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, we we have two kinds of committees in Saanich. One is uh, an advisory committee that is composed of uh, residents in our community who uh, who represent um, a variety of perspectives that that provide council with uh, advice or recommendations on issues. Another is uh, standing committees. Uh, we have two of them: finance and governance, and the housing affordability standing committee. Uh, as the mayor, I get to chair the um, Housing Affordability Standing Committee. There are three other members of council on that uh, committee, as well as three uh, representatives, um, one from the house, uh, community representatives, one from the development industry, one from the nonprofit sector, and one representing community associations. Uh, it's a great group, and it's uh, the, the group provides us with uh, recommendations from a policy perspective on things that the, the district can be doing in order to improve our processes around housing uh, development and approval, uh, but as well as policies that are gonna make it more conducive to getting affordable homes built. Um, it's been helpful to have a representative from the, the construction industry and the nonprofit sector who can give us really strong insight into some of the barriers that they face, some of the experiences that they've encountered that have limited their ability to deliver housing and importantly deliver affordable housing. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, is unique about nonprofit housing providers is that uh, they don't have, they don't, they can't transfer the costs of uh, development or construction onto the renter or buyer in the same way that uh, the private sector can. They're really constrained by the amount of government support uh, that they get in order to build buildings. Um, and the longer it takes, the higher the cost, then the fewer units they're able to, to build, which of course um, is a, a big uh, gap in capacity for the number of places that are affordable for people to settle in our community. So the, the Housing Affordability Standing Committee is a great uh, way for us to get, as a council, insight into that sector and uh, advice that can help inform our policies and, and bylaws. So where you live and where you work or where you go to school or where your kids go to school or where your kids go to swim and skate, that all involves transportation. You got to get from point A to point B. You have a transportation committee. Tell me about that. Yeah. So uh, the transportation committee is an advisory committee. It, it's composed of uh, community representatives from a, a, a variety of, of perspectives, including organizations that do advocacy for, for people walking and biking, uh, people who are representatives of uh, uh, disability organizations or who work, uh, who support individuals with uh, with a disability. Um, that group is uh, is really helpful in providing those, the confluence of perspectives on what transportation looks like uh, in Saanich. As you know, we're, we're a community that uh, was largely built out in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That means that in a lot of cases, there's not great sidewalks or bike lanes that uh, were part of the design of the community. And so there's been a lot of work done over the course of the last five years uh, through the active transportation plan to, to begin delivering uh, improvements that uh, make it easier and safer for people to get around. Uh, so that committee has insight and perspective uh, and recommendations that it offers council on that front. 
Uh, we've also um, developed a Rotate the Action Plan, which uh, is currently uh, in its final form. It's uh, headed for council for approval, and we're we're doing uh, a consultative process on the draft of that plan, which will will set out the the priority actions uh, that council needs to take, that the district needs to take, to ensure that our roads are safe for everyone to get around, uh, and that includes uh, the the top twenty or the worst twenty uh, corridors and uh, and intersections where. We know that people are at the, the greatest amount of risk and uh, where we need to take uh, much quicker action to ensure that uh, that those are, are fixed with design and infrastructure upgrades that are going to keep people safe on our roads. And as we travel around Saanich, we see that it does have that concentration of housing and retail and there's towers. There's going to be more towers. But in addition to that, Saanich has farmland in its really yes. interesting matrix and mix of the, of the footprint of the district. Uh, you have an agriculture committee. Tell me about that. Yeah, so um, we have um, a, we've got a couple of groups that uh, have an interest in in food security and food production. Uh, one of which is our uh, climate action and sustainability committee. So uh, under the sustainability division within Saanich, we have a, a, a food and agriculture specialist who helps support uh, food production uh, in in Saanich, ensuring that we're both protecting the farmland as well as um, advancing policies in the urban environment that allow people to, to grow food um, for themselves or for their neighbors. Uh, Sandwich also uh, is a member in the um, Peninsula and Area Agricultural Commission, which is composed of uh, farmers in the region who provide us with, uh, I think, really valuable policy perspective on, on some of the obstacles that farmers face and, and some of the concerns that uh, are in the marketplace around the protection of farmland to ensure that it remains in use for, for food production. Which is a priority because we don't have food security, food sovereignty in this area at all. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah. we don't produce, most of the food we consume on the South Island is not grown or produced on the South Island. And so we need to ensure that uh, we are able to support ourselves, particularly if, uh, you know, if in the event of a disaster, we're cut off from, from the lower mainland. We want to ensure that we've got adequate food supply for the residents here on the island. Yeah, food security is one of the top priorities for this chamber. There's also an organization that's going to be on here for a podcast shortly called CR Fair, Capital Region Food and Agriculture Initiative Roundtable. We'll talk with them about that and what we can do to secure our food supply. Because for a long time it was, well, we're one earthquake away from being cut off. Well, now we're one atmospheric river away from being cut off, as we've seen. So these are all matters of concern. You're a busy guy. We appreciate your time and your insight. Thanks for being with us today, Dean Murdoch, the mayor of the, of the District of Saanich. Thanks so much, Bruce. Always a pleasure to chat with you. And I will see you again soon for another Chamber Chat. Thank you.